box on the on the side there on YouTube. And uh, if you just have any questions, type it into that box there. And uh, I, um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Darren Alf from Bicycle Touring Pro. Um, I am the guy behind the bike. Bicycle Pro website, and for the last eight years or so, I've been helping people all over around the world plan and prepare, plan, prepare for, and execute their own bicycle touring adventures. So, um, yeah, and I do that through the website, through YouTube, through my books, um, all of that. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to make available the questions you had, and I'm sorry again. But uh, technical complications that we had just now. So I'm here. Um, one of the questions that was sent to me uh, earlier, I'm trying to get the article back up here, that, um, but uh, a Bicycle Touring Pro reader in Alaska emailed me and was ask, you know, saying that where he lives is currently in snow and he wants to prepare for a bike tour this summer, but he's not really sure of that. So um, he was saying, you know, what can I do where I am to prepare for, for his first bike tour? And the best thing really that you can do to prepare for any bike tour, whether it's your first tour or, or your 10th, um, is to get on your bike and ride and to do as much bike riding as you possibly can. Um, um, the best way to prepare for a bike tour is to ride your bike. And and I think one of the things that not only means like riding your bike, uh, like in a gym or something, that's great if you can do that, like for from a physicality standpoint, that's great. But um, from like a mentally training yourself thing, it's much better to ride in the street and to simulate the sorts of bike rides that you might do on your bicycle tour. If you're doing a long distance bike tour, um, something that, you know, outside of your home area that you're used to cycling in, you kind of have to be prepared for any type of bike tour or, or any type of road conditions is what I was trying to say, any type of road conditions. And so that means cycling in the streets, uh, you know, with cars or cycling in a bike lane or cycling, uh, you know, with a very narrow shoulder or, or anything. So um, I think that's probably, you know, one of the things that you need to keep in mind is like you can't expect the whole world and the whole bike tour that you're planning to be just like where you currently live. I think a lot of people make that assumption that like they live in London, England, and they assume the whole world is like London, England, and it's not. Um, so I think keep that in mind. One of the best things that you can do uh, if you're at home and training for, for a bike tour is to go on bike rides, but to not purposely not stick to the paths that you're used to taking. Like most people, when they go on a bike tour um, or when they ride near their home, I should say, uh, they stick to certain roads and trails that they know are kind of safe and, and they just follow the same routes over and over and over again. But when you're bike touring, it's not like that. And you have to kind of go outside of what you're comfortable with. So um, purposely, like, get lost is kind of what I'm telling you to do. So <laughs> purposely go down, you know, what's down that road? I don't know. Let's go down there. Um, great. And we had technical difficulties now at the beginning. And now the gardener is here and is making a bunch of noise outside. So I hope you can't hear that too well. Um, if if it gets too loud, I'll have to move or something. But he's doing the weed whacker and the lawn, you know, lawnmower and stuff outside. Anyways, uh, bad timing. Um, so, anyways, those are my quick little tips for um, training for your first, second, or third bike tour. Um, question here from the from YouTube says, uh, what was your best experience on a bike tour and what was your worst? Well, I've had a lot of, I don't know if there's any like best or worst, really. There's a lot of good and a lot of bad. Um, not that many bad, actually. But the, I think the best thing that happened to me on maybe any of my trips is just like when a stranger invites me into their home 
and and it turns out to be like a great experience. I've talked about before how on my second bike tour, I was invited uh, in by this guy at a gas station, basically, who he wasn't wearing a shirt. He probably weighed 300 pounds, big beer belly, and dark tan, like he'd never worn a shirt in his whole life. And uh, he invited me into his home, and I was kind of scared, but it ended up being like a great experience. He was he used to be a chef in New York City, so he like cooked me this incredible pasta dinner. And he had two kids uh, at home, and like they were like twelve or thirteen years old. And, and we play. I played chess with them, and and all kind. Of, I don't know. They they toured me around their farm that they lived on and stuff. So that was a really great experience. And I think over the years, like I've been bike touring now for sixteen years, and I think like the best moments are those when people invite you in um like the unexpected happens like you aren't expecting a stranger to be like hey you need some free food and a shower and a place to stay and you're like yeah i do <laughs> that's the best so um gosh there's been a lot of really other good experiences i mean i think when i look back on it now like the most difficult cycling experiences uh, like where when you're in the moment you're like oh my god this is terrible and I want to go home and just lay in bed like at the time those feel like the worst moments but afterwards they're really the best so um, yeah uh, <laughs> that's that's all I have to say I guess like I, uh, I'm thinking of I was in Iceland in 2002 or 2012 sorry and uh, and I was there with my friend Brandon and we were in this like crazy uh, windstorm, like dust and, and we were going through this area that had snow and it was kicking up, like it wasn't snowing, but there was so much wind that all the snow on the ground was just flying in our faces at super high speeds. Um, and it hurt like physically to get hit by the snow. And at the time, like it, it was really cool. Like we were totally covering our faces um, I've posted pictures of this on BicycleTrainPro.com, but uh, like I, we were, our faces and bodies were totally covered in clothing, but I had to see where I was going. So I had like a face mask just with one eye out like this, and I would keep my head down, uh, you know, so that the wind and the snow didn't hit me in the face. And then I would just look up for half a second and then look down to see where I was going again and do that over and over and over again for hours on end. Um, that was at you know one of those moments that at the time it was like oh my gosh this is crazy you know but when I look back on it now it was like really I thought it was kind of fun actually <laughs> so um, anyways one of those moments you'll never forget um, as far as worst experiences I've ever had uh, you know obviously the first thing that comes to mind is just when I've gotten food poisoning I got food poisoning when I was in South Africa which you know, that's not fun. You spend like a week on the toilet. Got food poisoning in Peru, same thing. Um, and it's, it's like the food poisoning and stuff is not that bad maybe by itself. But what's scary is like for me, example, for example, I was psych cycling and traveling by myself. So um, being sick and in a foreign country far from home or anybody you know, I think that is the scariest part. And that's why I really have been telling people recently, like, you know, one of the, like, uh, the first question that I answered today was, you know, how do I prepare for a bike tour? And one of the best things you can do is stay healthy, like do anything and everything you can to stay healthy, because if you're not healthy, you can't go on a bike tour. Um, and yeah, so don't get sick. Um, do everything you can to maintain your health. Um, other worst moments on my bike tour, I think it can get a little lonely at times, especially when you're like in a foreign country and nobody speaks the same language and you've gone for two weeks without talking to anyone. I think that that has gotten to me a little bit on some of my trips. Um, but other than that, like nothing is really, nothing really bad has happened. Like. I've never had stuff stolen from me. I've never been robbed. Um, like I've never had, like I've never really crashed my bike. I I, uh, I fell off my bike in Swaziland, but nothing, like I scratched my knee, you know what I mean? Nothing serious. So 
Um, honestly, like a lot of people are afraid of the dangers of bike touring, but probably the most dangerous aspects of traveling by bike are the weather, like the, being out in the sun all the time, um, protecting your skin and stuff. And, you know, like I said, being healthy, eating the right stuff, making sure you're getting enough nutrients and for all the calories that you're exuding. There goes the lawnmower now. I'm gonna maybe move, but I don't know where. Hold on, sorry. <laughs> We're gonna do a quick walk through the house here. I don't know where to go, where, the, where you can see me. I'm just gonna go up here and go into the bathroom maybe, where it's kind of quiet. Okay, I'm in the bathroom. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, let me switch back here. But yeah, the, the dangers of bike turning are really not that great. Um, I think, you know, obviously you don't want to get hit by a car or something, but if you're smart and if you use a bike mirror and you pay attention to your surroundings, um, the risk, the, you know, the chances of that are pretty small. So, um, yeah. Anyways, uh, another question. What are you doing for having internet and electricity anywhere? That's a good question, and it's still something that I'm struggling with after 16 years of bike train all around the world. The answer to that question is it really does depend on where you are in the world and what kind of infrastructure that they have available uh, there. Um, I think one of the best places in the world uh, as far as internet and electricity and stuff goes is Finland. Um, I was really, really impressed with Finland. Um, you can get a, as long as you have like a smartphone, an unlocked international smartphone that will accept a SIM card, you can get a, a SIM card in Finland for like 20 euros, which is about $22 or so, US dollars. And that will give you like unlimited internet, phone, text, etc., for a month. $22. Here in America, where I happen to be at the moment and I'm from, unlimited internet probably costs you $200 a month. So, um, anyways, yeah. So, yeah, it just very much depends. And, and, like, I was in, let's say, South Africa just a couple of years ago, two years ago, and I, and I had internet uh, available to me, but it was so slow that just opening in an email and sending one email might take 15 to 20 minutes. So, um, you know, it really just depends. But the, the world is really moving fast, and I think the technology is, you know, going up and up and up every year, and it's going to become easier and easier to have access to the Internet almost anywhere. Um, as far as inter uh, electricity goes, that's, that's a, another thing. I mean, obviously, if you're staying in hotels every night or something, or, or even camp establish campgrounds, um, there's going to be electricity available to you, so that's not much of a problem. The problem occurs when you are camping for nights on end. Um, and, and I don't mean camping in a campground, but camping just out in the wild. Um, and that's why in recent years you've seen me use a solar panel on the back of my bicycle. So I carry this solar panel on the back of my bike and it is constantly charging a battery that I carry with me. And from that battery, I can then power later in the evening, whatever, my smartphone, my bike lights, my GoPro video camera, etc. So the solar panel is not like producing enough electricity that I can just have my smartphone on all the time. I have to be very conservative still uh, even while using solar power, um, but um, the solar having like I have a six watt solar panel on the back of my bike, and having this small solar panel there allows me to go for about a week, five to seven days, I would say, um, without ever having to plug my smartphone into a power outlet. So, um, like I said, it's not the ultimate solution. Like, I couldn't go forever just based on solar power, I don't think. Um, but it does extend the life of the batteries that I am carrying with me. So, yeah, solar. There's also hubs that you can buy that are expensive, frankly, 
um, uh, hubs that generate power from the movement of the wheels on your bike. Uh, I don't have one of these, and I've not tested it over the long run, but a lot of bike tourists do have this on their bicycle, um, and it is a way of generating power also. So, um, Luke says, have you tried using mer uh, merino wool on tour? I heard that it's great for not stinking for longer periods. Yeah, I've used it, um, but I've actually moved away from it or – anything like it really um i don't i explain uh for my jerseys for example like i've been wearing these fox racing jerseys for the last several years and it's because i just love them uh as far as their fit feel and comfort and the fact that they don't stink after a whole day's worth of use um you can i just ordered two new jerseys by the way from Fox Racing. The website is foxracing.com. That's where I get the jerseys. And then I go to the mountain bike section. They don't actually have touring bike jerseys. Um, and so, yeah, you go to the mountain bike section, go to jerseys, and that's where I get all my bike gear from. Um, and yeah. But yeah, like a lot of people really like that wool. Um, I'm not a big fan, to be honest. Um, but I think a lot of things about bike touring are like very personal. Like, like in my book, The Bicycle Touring Blueprint, I try to give guidelines um, for the gear and stuff that you should use. But I try not to point people too much towards a specific brand or whatever. So um, I don't don't feel like I answered your question all that much, but, but yeah, wool is good for so many things. Um, it just depends on your bike tour, where you're going, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, David said, do you use Bitcoin? I highly recommend it. Potential benefits for travelers is huge. No, I don't use Bitcoin and I've never seen an opportunity to use it while I'm traveling. So I'd be curious to hear what you use it for. Um, I mean, obviously, I see websites and stuff that are offering to pay in Bitcoin, but I've never, I've never gone up to a you know Peruvian stall person, <laughs> and and they've said, you know, it's two lei or three bitcoins. So, anyways, uh, <laughs> is it possible to charge a laptop from a USB Dynamo or solar panel? Yes, and yes. Um, most solar panels, however, like, like, or really any device that you charge off of a solar panel, you usually don't plug it straight into the solar panel. So that's like the first thing you got to learn. Like, usually you're, you have a solar panel and a dedicated battery, like an external battery that you are charging from that solar panel. So you charge that battery, and then you charge your laptop or your smartphone or whatever you happen to be charging. So yeah, like... Um, David, if you go to BicycleTurnPro.com right now and type in laptop solar panel, you'll find the article I did about uh, this Voltaic, I think it's 18 or 20 watt solar panel that they make that's built for charging your laptop and pretty much any other device that you happen to have. So yeah, check that out. Um, that panel that I reviewed is kind of big and I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Um, for bike touring unless you're prepared to carry the extra weight. Um, but if like having your laptop is su super important uh, to your trip, um, then that's certainly something to look into. Um, David says, have you seen the cycling? Yeah, the, the videos I want to see the world on YouTube. Yes, I have. Um, they're very cool. Uh, Peter says, I'd like to travel on tandem on a 29-inch wheel. Any advice on tandems and tire size? We plan on traveling in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, as well as other places. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I happen to ride a Comotion touring bicycle and Comotion uh, Cycles, the name of the company that makes my bicycle, they specialize in making uh, both tandems and touring bicycles. So you should look at Comotion. They might have something for you. Um, I know a lot of the people that have done round-the-world trips on a tandem have used a Comotion bike. So check them out. 
Um, you might also want to talk to the people at Commotion, tell them what you're doing, and they might steer you in a particular direction. Um, while 29-inch wheels are becoming more and more popular, um, if you're planning a international trip, Asia, Africa, Latin America, etc., you might want to go with the standard 26-inch wheel um, because 29-inch wheels and tires and tubes and all the parts that you might need if your bike were to break uh, while you're down there in one of those third world countries, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult to find a 29-inch wheel. So, yeah, you might, like, like my turn bicycle now, I have, is a 26-inch wheel. And it's because I wanted the bike that I could take anywhere in the world and that if something broke, I could get it fixed at the guy from the, you know, from the guy down the corner. Um, I didn't want to have to order a special part um, just because of that. So, anyways. Um, yeah, Thorne's a British bike company. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, there's a bunch of, there's a few, com I don't know if there's a bunch, but there's a few, quite a few companies that do make tandem touring bicycles. So, yeah, you got some shopping ahead of you. Um, I was sent a few questions in advance, so I want to flip over to um, some of the questions that were sent to me. Um, one of the questions I got said, why do some people carry their panniers, those bag backpack-sized bags that you see on all my photos, why do some people carry their panniers on the back of their bike and other people carry panniers on the front? Or some people carry both front and rear panniers. Um, that's a good question. And the reason is, <laughs> well, mainly, uh, I think most people, if they're traveling super lightweight and are going on a shorter bike trip, um, they usually are packing two panniers on the back of their bicycle. That's traditionally what you see. Um, it's very rare to see somebody riding a bike with just two panniers on the front of their bicycle. That would be quite odd. Um, but yeah, you usually see the two panniers on the back and maybe a bungee cord with some other stuff on the rear rack, maybe a handlebar bag or something small up front. Um, that's a lightweight touring setup. And um, really, with just two panniers, you could cycle all the way around the world with everything that you uh, need. In fact, I just finished a video. I haven't posted it here on the Bicycle Touring Pro YouTube channel, but I just finished editing a video um, that I'll be posting soon about my uh, lightweight bike touring setup that I would recommend for anybody. It can be used for local bike tours, you know, anywhere from a two to five day trip near your home, or really you could use this lightweight packing uh, list that I've created to go all the way around the world. And the kit that I've kind of presenting in this video is just two rear panniers on the back of your bicycle and a handlebar bag up front. And everything you need for your trip fits inside that. So um, that's called lightweight bike touring when you see just those two rear panniers. When you see somebody with uh, a set of four panniers, they have two bags on the back of the bicycle and two bags on the front. You've probably seen me riding a bike like that um, if you've seen the photos of me on Bicycle Train Pro. Um, that is called fully loaded bike touring is, is often what you hear it called. Um, and, and yeah, and it's exactly as it sounds. Um, it's just more gear uh, on your bike. The, there's discrepancies in the bike touring world, however, about how that weight of the gear should be distributed across your bicycle. And I think that might be what this person was alluding to, is like, why do some people put more weight on the front of their bicycle than on the back? Um, I, for example, tend to put more weight on the back of my bicycle than on the front, but other people switch it around and they put about 60% of the weight on the front of their bicycle and 40% of the weight on the back. And um, the reason for this is because imagine yourself sitting on a bike. Most of your weight already is on the back of the bicycle. Um, so the idea is that by putting even more weight on the back of your bike, you're putting your bike under stress and causing you know, potential spokes to break, the frame to break, the rack to break, et cetera, um, over time. You know? And so the idea is put 
some weight up front, 60% of your weight up front, and only 40% in the back, and that kind of evens out the weight across your bicycle and, and is supposed to be healthier for the frame, the racks, and your tires and stuff, uh, wheels on your bike. So um, that's the thinking behind that whole packing thing. Um, but yeah, I don't know if I answered that very clearly. Uh, let me, I'm reading your questions here. <laughs> uh, it says, I've been to your website and I know you've touched upon the subject before, but can you elaborate on waste management, number twos, et cetera? Uh, that's a fun question. Well, 90% of the time, honestly, I'm able to find a, uh, an established restroom to go to the, you know, to go to the bathroom. Uh, whether you go into a gas station, you go into a restaurant, you go into a hotel, uh, you, somebody just lets you into their house, uh, there's usually somewhere to go, usually. Now, there are instances, especially if you're going to do a lot of wild camping where you're just camping out in the woods or desert or wherever, where you're not going to be around a toilet and you got to go. And in those cases, you kind of just got to do what you got to do, to be honest. Um, it takes a little practice, I think. Um, but yeah, usually I just kick a hole in the ground, sort of, and and then cover it up once I'm done. That, and honestly, that's like it. Um, but like one of the things that I've really been emphasizing to people uh, lately, which is kind of embarrassing, but uh, is r reminding people that they should always carry like a half roll of toilet paper with them on their bike tours. This is good for blowing your nose, but it's also good in case you, you know, are stuck in the middle of nowhere and you got to do a number two. So um, add that half roll of toilet paper to your packing list and make sure you're always got, you know, a little bit of paper uh, in your bag. So, yeah. Uh, hi, Darren. I just wrapped up my nine-month tour. I've thought of making a living off bike train. Do you have any tips for building content for a website? Well, I've been doing this for eight years now, and honestly, I wouldn't recommend bike touring as a living. Um, <laughs> I still don't know uh, if I'm succeeding in that regard. Um, so I honestly, I would uh, think about it again, to be honest. I wouldn't recommend anybody follow the path that I'm taking, per se. Um, I think bike touring is awesome, and I'm glad that you enjoy it. I think that what you, if it were me, if I were giving advice to myself, maybe eight years ago when I started Bicycle Turn Pro, um, I would say, you know, go on, keep going on bike tours, but find something that you can do while you're traveling to make money. Um, you know, there are so many jobs now where you can work from anywhere in the world. And you don't have to have an established, you know, a regular nine to five job. You can write or program or, you know, illustrate for other people. There's so many things you can do online. There's online coaches and I don't know, so many things. You could generate some kind of passive income, write books about your travels or or something that you know. Um, there's a lot of things that you could do, but I wouldn't necessarily, honestly, recommend making a living from bike touring. It's, it's very tough, I think. Um, yeah, I have so many friends now, because of Bicycle Touring Pro, that do similar things to me, uh, as me, like, um, they travel the world and do whatever they want to do. But the, the truth is they make their money usually in other ways, like not necessarily related to their job per se. Like, like I have a friend, um, he loves to travel and he's always in the Caribbean and, and island hopping and everything, uh, living it up. But what you don't see uh, if you were to follow him on Facebook or something is all the time that he spends in front of the computer designing websites for companies around the world. That's his real job, but it just so happens that his job can be done anywhere. So he does it on an island in Mexico or something. 
Um, and, and that is the kind of thing I would recommend for you too, is like find something that you're knowledgeable about, like what is your job right now, for example? Is there any way that you could take that job and make it uh, so that you could do it wherever you want to go, you know? Um, I've said it before and I'll say it again, like, uh, and people ask me this question all the time and um, I think the best thing that you could possibly do, like, I could talk about this question all day and for like 24 hours and still have more to talk about, but the best thing that I think you could do is read the book The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss. That book is what you're looking for. Like, that book describes exactly what I do, essentially, which is like, I said, like, I, I want to travel the world and ride my bike and, and somehow make money at the same time. And that book describes exactly how to do that. So check out that book. It's called The 4-Hour Workweek. It was like a New York Times bestseller for like seven years or something like that. Um, and yeah, it's a short, simple book. Like you could read it in a couple hours, but I think um, it might just blow your mind. I reread it like three times a year because it's got such good stuff in there. Anyways, um, I hope I that answered your question. Uh, let me go back here. Yeah. Yeah, good question. I'm wondering where to keep your bike when you want to explore an area on foot, but don't have lodging or another place to leave the bike. Yeah, that's probably, honestly, that's like the most asked question that I probably get from people. Um, and it's a good question because it's not so obvious, really. Um, you know, a lot of people think that you might just like find a place a tree or something to lock your bike to and leave it there, but that's really not the case. Um, what you want to do, uh, usually, like it, let's say you're in a city, um, I don't know, I'm just, yeah, you're in uh, Paris, for example, and you want to go up the Eiffel Tower. Uh, what do you do with your bicycle? You can't bring it up there with you, obviously. So what I normally do if I was in that circumstance is I would find a local business usually that would be willing to watch my bicycle for a short period of time. Bike shops are a great place to start. Uh, if not a bike shop, a local hotel. I've, I, I've gone into like hotels all the time that I'm not even staying in and just said like, I just need to keep my bags here or my bike here for a couple hours and I'll be back at 2 p.m., you know? And usually that's not a problem. So that's kind of where, what I normally do. If you're going into like a local business, like a supermarket or a movie theater or something, you can usually just ask somebody that's working there if you can bring your bike in. Like I've gone into movie theaters with my bike before and said like, hey, I'm traveling on my bike. Can I, is there like a closet or something you can put this in uh, while I watch the movie? And that's never been a problem. They, they want your money, so. <laughs> Usually they'll accommodate you. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I do. And I, um, maybe I can move that. Sounds like the gardener is finished. I'll move back downstairs. Um, but yeah, like I don't lock my bike up um, outside for more than like five minutes. Like I, the only time really I lock my bike is like when I'm going into the supermarket for a couple seconds and then coming right back out or if I'm like in an established campground with a bunch of people around then I lock, I lock my bike but um, the rest of the time the bike is either at my side or it's in some kind of un, in the trust of somebody that I've asked to watch my bike basically so yeah um, I hope that answers it uh, Jake says, um, even if you've been doing this bicycle turn for several years, have you thought about settling down? Yeah, I think about it all the time, actually. Um, and I've told myself on multiple trips, like, oh, this is going to be my last trip. And then a year later, I go on another trip. So, um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, it's hard to explain. In 2006, 
I bought a house um, and I thought I was going to settle down then. Um, I still own the house and I'm still paying for it, but I have somebody else living in the house because I'm never there. So yeah, um, if I want to settle down, I got a place to go back to, I guess. Um, but the more I travel, the more I realize I want to travel some more because there's so much out there. Um, and I think for me, like, and obviously this is just for me and I know other people feel differently, but for me, the days go by too quickly when I'm settled down. Like, like if I'm in the same place for a month, man, that month goes quick. But if I spend a month on the road, it feels like a year, a wonderful year. Um, and, and I love that feeling of time being slowed down, you know? Um, so yeah, like m the movement, uh, is, makes me feel good and yeah, I like it. So obviously there are drawbacks to constantly being on the move. Even like if you go away on a bike trip for a year, even, um, you know, you're going to lose touch with friends and family and all that. So, um, it is a little different and, and I've had problems, I think, uh, in recent years, because I am gone so often, the people that I might call my friends back home, you know, you lose touch with and, and I'm not friends with them now in the way that I used to be. Um, and, and I don't blame them for that. I certainly blame myself because I made that decision to go away. You know what I mean? So yeah, there are definite drawbacks to constantly being on the move, but there are also tons of benefits. I mean, I, I get to go to amazing places, uh, have these experiences that so few people in the world will ever get to have. I meet a lot of really cool people. Um, I meet a lot of interesting, <laughs> crazy people. Uh, and, and you get, like, I learn a lot on my bike tours, I think, like not just about myself, but about the world. Um, and yeah, like there's so many benefits. It's really awesome. So. At this point, I'm still very young. I still just want to keep traveling and and um, I'm really enjoying like helping other people now that I've been doing this for 16 years. Like it's fun to get photos and videos and emails and stuff from people like you that have, uh, you know, taken my advice and gone on their very own bike tours. So um, yeah, that's really cool. Um, and I, I just want to keep doing that, I guess. So yeah. Um, Stefano G says, have you ridden the U.S. Northern Tier route before? Um, how was your experience? If so, Stefano, I've cycled across the United States six times, and the Northern Tier is one of the routes I have not done, unfortunately. Um, I really want to do it. That's probably if I were to cycle across the U.S. now, that would be the route I would do. And I've said before on Bicycle Training Pro, that, um, one of the I think biggest mistakes I've probably made in my whole bike touring career was doing the Trans-American bike route across America instead of doing the Northern Tier. I should have done the Northern Tier. I found the Trans-American route to be kind of boring, frankly, too much farmland for me. Um, and I think I would have enjoyed the forests and stuff of Montana and that kind of area a whole lot more. So you'll have to go on that trip for me. You'll have to send me a photo or a video and tell me how it is because, um, yeah, it looks really cool. Uh, Dan says, hello, Darren. I have an upcoming self-supported solo cross-country trip, and my biggest concern is keeping my bike and pannier safe when I'm restocking supplies, et cetera, stores, advice. Well, that's kind of the question I asked before or answered before. Um, but, yeah, like, like when you leave your bike, frankly, try not to ever leave your bike. That's my first <laughs> rule for keeping your bike and belonging safe uh, on your trip. If you go inside a store, take anything that is valuable with you, okay? Um, don't leave anything on your bike that you want. Uh, <laughs> you know, usually like when I go into store, I travel with my laptop and stuff and DSLR camera, both of which cost a lot of money. And I bring those things into the store with me uh, when I'm traveling. So that would be my first piece of advice. And like I um, said earlier, um, don't leave your bike for very long, like five minutes, 10 minutes tops or something. Um, and like when I go into a supermarket, for example, like I try to lock the bike in an area that I can see it from the outside of the store. 
um, so that while I'm shopping, I can kind of go and look and say, okay, the bike's still there, the, all my stuff's still there, there's no one, no weird person standing next to my bike, you know? And if I see somebody out there, I go out there. Like, I just drop my shopping and go back out there, you know? So um, that's maybe the second little part of my tip there. And then the third thing is, if you're really concerned about your bike, ask if you can bring your bike inside um, and while you're doing your shopping or whatever. Um, and usually that's not a problem. I mean, some people might say no, or they might just say lock it up outside or something like that. But um, try to explain, and most people are pretty accommodating. Like I said, most people want businesses and stuff want your money, they want you to come inside, so if they can help you come inside and spend money, they'll probably do that. Um, MH Palm says, can money be made from YouTube or Facebook advertisements to support bike packers? Yes, probably. Um, I don't think it's very much, uh, unless you have a huge, huge following, probably. Um, but, yeah, that's just based off of my experience. Uh, how would you recommend I protect myself at night camping in areas of Af Africa with wild animals? Good question, Andrew, um, because, yeah, I've been to Africa, and I was concerned about this the first time I went there. Um, honestly, like most of the big animals that you would think would be a danger, lions and hippos and elephants and stuff like that are not just out in the wild, like roaming around in Africa. Most of them are behind fences in game parks or reserves of some kind. So as long as you don't hop one of those big fences, you'll probably not have any lion encounters while you're in Africa. There are, however, other wild animals running around in Africa. There are wildebeest, there are various forms of antelope, um, and I think, in my experience at least, the most dangerous animal that I came across in Africa were the, the, the baboons. Um, there are these large packs of baboons that run around um, in certain countries, and baboons, in case you've never seen one, they're about as big as you or I are. Like, some of them are very, very large. Um, they can run incredibly fast. They have huge teeth. Uh, they can kill you. And, <laughs> yeah, and so you don't want to camp anywhere near where there are baboons. Like, that's the first thing. Just don't get anywhere near them. They're, they're largely territorial, I think. And so they stick to these areas that are, they're familiar with. So stay out of any area where you see baboon poo or food or anything. Um, that's probably really the only animal that you kind of need to be aware of. Obviously, um, there are parks in Africa that allow you to ride your bike through them. Most of these parks do not have wild animals in there. Uh, or they have wild animals, but none that will like jump out of the bushes and kill you, like lions, for example. Um, I went, to, I was in South Africa recently, and I saw this one nature uh, reserve or something like that, and I went up to the gate, and I was like, can I ride my bike through here? And the guard was like thinking about it for a moment. And he was like, well, there are lions in here. And so I was like, so no, <laughs> I can't ride my bike. And he was like, yeah, probably not. It's probably not a good idea. <laughs> and I was like, okay, thank you. But he, you know, he wasn't even aware really of what the policy was because so few people had come by on a bicycle. Um, so you kind of have to, be smart and be aware. But most of the time when you're cycling out there in the countryside of Africa, um, you don't have to worry about the animals, but there are a lot of people in the road. And that's probably, if anything, is going to be a danger. It's the other people and cars and stuff that are out there. So, um, Just a few more questions, guys, and then I got to go. I'm sorry about that. Um, we started a little bit late today, so I'll hang around for a couple extra minutes. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> one question, good foods to bring with you during the day? That's a good question. Um, again, it depends on where you are in the world and what kind of foods are available. My favorite foods are like trail mix. I love trail mix, like nuts, cashews, raisins, that sort of thing. Um, high in protein. 
Um, you need a lot of carbs when you're cycling, and I love bananas. I think bananas are great, lots of power in the bananas. You can eat like five of those a day or more, um, and they're cheap usually in most parts of the world. Uh, what else? What else? Um, yeah, those are my main two <laughs> that I go to, I guess. Um, but yeah, it really just depends on where you are because one country, honestly, is so different than the other. Like the foods, you cross a border and the food just completely changes. So it's, uh, it really just depends. Um, what do you use to edit your videos? I just use iMovie on my Mac. Uh, it's free editing software and that's all I use. Nothing fancy. Um, Roundabout Way says, how do you manage your time editing videos and filming where you've been? That's a good question, and honestly, it's something I'm still struggling with. Um, I've really only just started doing the videos kind of more frequently. I should have been doing them 16 years, for the whole past 16 years. That'd be awesome if I had 16 years of videos on here, um, but I don't. Um, I'm kicking myself for that now. Um, managing the videos, it, again, depends on where I am. I'm gonna grab some water really quick, guys. Hold on, and I'll come back to this question. I just, my voice is like dying on me here. One second. <laughs> okay, sorry about that. I was just like, huh. Okay, so videos, yeah. I recently did a bike tour from like Poland, across Ukraine, and into Romania. And this was during the early springtime, late winter. It's really cold outside, and I wasn't really camping every night. I was staying mostly in hotels. And um, I was able to do this in large part because that part of the world is really cheap. Like in Ukraine, the most expensive hotel that I paid for was 13 US dollars. The cheapest one was like five, five and a half dollars. Um, so like it wasn't any trouble for me to pay five to thirteen dollars a night to stay in a hotel and in those instances when I was in a hotel I had access to power and internet um, it was easy for me after a long day of cycling and nothing really else to do I would grab some food take a shower and then I'd sit down and edit my video from the day that was very easy to do when I was in a hotel and had a place to stay at the end of every night. Unfortunately, uh, most of my bike tours aren't like that and I spend a lot of time camping. If any of you followed me on my recent bike trip through Scandinavia, Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, you saw that I was camping quite a bit of the time. And on those uh, nights, I was certainly not doing any video editing. What I did, I was in Scandinavia for about three months um, and every day practically I made a video and so I would shoot the video and then at the end of the day I would dump the, the video that I had shot onto my external hard drive that I travel with and I would label it in a folder for that day like July 31st or whatever um, and then I wasn't able to edit those videos until I got home like three months later after the trip was over basically so um, and it took me like a whole month to, to edit three months worth of videos. It, it, was, it took a lot of time. So that's kind of the spectrum that I've been working with. It's like sometimes I can edit the video that night, the day after I've shot it. And other times uh, I have to wait three months later to edit the video. So uh, I, would, I would love to be able to edit the video you know, every night and then just move on and do it again the next night. So. Um, until I figure out a way to make that happen, I just have to keep doing what I can. But yeah, that's kind of the way it works sometimes. Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. the questions are jumping around. Thomas says, I'd like to know about pepper spray. I was attacked by a dog three miles out of town. Uh, you know, I've been bike touring around the world for 16 years and I've never been attacked by a dog. Um, I'm, I'm sure it does happen. Um, I've been chased by thousands of dogs and barked at by thousands of dogs, but I'm, I've, my bags, I've had two dogs bite my bags on my bike 
and rip holes in the bag, but I've never been bitten myself. Usually the bikes are fascinated by the bike and not me. So um, I hear a lot of people worry about dogs and I, um, it's honestly, I don't think as much of a concern as, as people make it out to be, but I know that some people have big fears of dogs and, and, and so I don't wanna take those people lightly. Um, as far as pepper spray is concerned, I've never felt the need to pepper spray a dog or another human being, really, on any of my trips. Um, and honestly, pepper spray is illegal in many parts of the world, so it depends on where you're going. Um, if you get caught with that, you could get in a lot of trouble. So just keep that in mind. Um, but if it is legal in your part of the world, I honestly don't have anything to say uh, about it other than if, if you're nervous about it, carry it. And, and, and the, th the thing about dogs though, or really any attack of any kind, I think that might happen to you is it happens very quickly. So like you can't be like searching in your bag for like, where's the pepper spray? I need to get it out now. Like you have to have it like on your handlebars ready to use in a moment's notice. So um, that's kind of why, like I did carry pepper spray on some of my early bike tours in the United States, never used it after six years and said, I probably never will use it. So I stopped carrying it. Um, and yeah, that's how I feel about pepper spray. Um, but yeah. <laughs> da, 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 da. Andrew says, have you ever been robbed or threatened by other people while on tour? Uh, the short answer to that question is no, I've never been robbed or had anybody threaten me, really. Um, the thing that maybe doesn't come across on video here is like, I'm really tall. Like I'm six foot one, six foot two, somewhere around there. I'm taller than probably 90% of the people in the world. And so I look down at most people. Um, and I think that helps me in a lot of situations. Like I was in Peru um, just a couple years ago and like I was literally twice as tall as a lot of the people there. Um, <laughs> like I sat next to this woman on the bus one time, like my knees were hitting the, the seat in front of me like crazy. Like I had to scrunch my, my knees way up just to squeeze into this bus seat. And the lady next to me, she had her feet all the way out in front of her and there was still room between the bottoms of her feet and the chair in front of her. Like that's how short she was. And, um, and yeah. And anyway, from a like personal safety standpoint, I think that does like help me. Um, but you watching and you know, there's men watching, women watching, um, and people of various, various experiences watching and, and the, circumstances are going to be different for each and every person. So um, personal safety is like a major concern, especially if you go to some of the more dodgy parts of the world. Um, like I've never had anybody eat, honestly, like even try to physically um, get anything out of me, but a lot of people, um, especially in poorer parts of the world will ask for money will ask for food, um, that kind of a thing. And, and I think you just have to learn how to deal with that a lot of times. Um, another like thing, maybe a tip that I, I could give in that regards is like, I have a very, and maybe this is an American thing too, but like I have a pretty big bubble around me. Like I don't like people in my bubble. And if people, especially when I'm on my bike, you know, cars, if a car gets in my bubble, I let them know, you know. Um, and uh, same is true with people when I'm on or off the bike. And I have had circumstances, um, I'm thinking of one particular instance when I was in the African country of Lesotho, this man came up to me and put his hands on my handlebars. Um, and I think he just wanted to talk to me. But like, for me, that crossed the line and I let him know it. Like, I was like, dude, don't touch my bike. Like that's off limits basically. Um, and that, I think you kind of have to do that sometimes. Like you can't let people 
encroach on your area too much. Like, and I have done that. Like I, I've literally like put my hand in front of people sometimes and been like, get back, you know? Um, so, uh, I don't feel good about doing that at the time because I, like, like I said, like a lot of times people are just trying to be nice or they, they want to talk to you or they want to see what your bike is all about or something. But, um, like, I don't know who that person is. I don't know what their intentions are. So I, I generally play it safe. I'm, I'm like a, the most safe person that you can think of. And, um, like, especially when you're going to a new country that you don't know what the rules are or how people behave, you, you should probably be especially cautious during the first couple of days. Um, and just, you know, don't put your bike anywhere. Don't necessarily trust anything that anyone says. Um, you know, always double check things, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, that's, that's all I have to say. I mean, I run bicycletrainpro.com and I'm become like the epicenter for bike touring news and stuff. So I do hear about the horror stories and there are some horror stories. I mean, I have heard of, um, bike tourists being held up at gunpoint, nothing serious happened. Um, I've, there was uh, a gentleman who, um, I don't want to scare you guys now, but a gentleman who was uh, attacked with a machete in Africa and hit in the arm with a machete um, so that they could steal his bike, those sorts of things. So honestly, like I've spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, what would I do if I was in that sort of situation? And the truth is I just let him have everything, I'm t you know, everything I got. Um, so um you know i don't think there's any reason to risk your life for your bike and some bags and some dirty clothes you know so yeah that's all i got to say uh andrew says is there a bicycle train lady in your life or is lonely devoting so much time to this is it lonely at the top <laughs> that's a good question uh, i get asked about a lot no there's no bicycle train lady um at the moment i guess um it sure would be nice maybe um but no not at the moment i'm yeah i don't know uh i i think i've mentioned it before like um uh, i've been bike touring now for 16 years and i've met a lot of female bike tourists on the road but they're usually traveling with like their boyfriend or their husband or their girlfriends i've I've only, I think now in 16 years, met like one, maybe two solo female bike tourists. And I think that's kind of sad. Like I'd like to see that change um, because I know that there are a lot of women uh, that follow bike Bicycle Train Pro and that want to get into bike touring. But I think safety is, is a big concern for a lot of these uh, women. And I think that sucks because um, in my experience, the world is like a very safe place. Like people are friendly, but I do know that the world is very different uh, when you're a woman and I've seen it um, sadly on my travels. Um, if, if I could change anything about the world, maybe that would be, that would be up there on my list of things I'd want to change is to make it um, safer for women to go on solo trips, I guess. Um, but yeah, what, I'm just gonna answer a couple more questions, guys. I'm sorry, I, uh, we're running out of time here. Um, <laughs> Joseph says, how do you let no, cars know if you're in their bubble? How do they react? Well, usually if they, what I meant by that is like, like usually like when you're in the lane and you know a car is coming, like oftentimes you'll see them kind of, you know, circle around you a little bit to move out of your way. But then there are other cars that just try to get as close to you or just ignore you completely and like clip your elbow while you're riding. Um, and those people, you know, I maybe throw a fist at them or <laughs> something like that to say, hey, he almost killed me, you know. Um, but I mean, there have been instances too, like in tr where I'm riding in traffic or something where I will like bang on the glass of the, of the car next to me or something like that just to let them know that I'm there. Um, but like I said, it kind of depends on the circumstance. So yeah. Um, 
Anyways, I'm going to answer one more question that was sent to me uh, previously because I got a bunch of questions. And then I think we'll wrap it up here for tonight, uh, today. Um, <laughs> how do you, so Paul wrote to me and said, how can I find someone to go on a bike tour with me? Where should I look for good touring partners? That's a very good question. And another one that I get a lot, um, <laughs> Daniel, I see your question about Columbia. I was supposed to be there right now, actually. Um, Daniel said, have I ever been to Columbia? And I'm sp I was supposed to be there right now, but I had to, and I was going to be in Columbia for three whole months, and I was so looking forward to it. But I got sick right before the trip was about to begin, and I had to cancel the whole trip. <sighs> so I'm in Southern California right now, um, and I'm feeling a lot better, uh, but um, I had to cancel the Columbia trip. And I'm going to do some local, like, Southern California trips this month. Um, next month, I'm hoping to ride Baja, Mexico. We'll see if that's going to happen. I'm not 100% sure. But I'll have to come back to Columbia at some other point. Um, anyways, back to my question about how to find touring partners. That's a good question and something, again, I still struggle with to this day. Um, on my first bike trip that I did, like I was 17 years old and my parents didn't want me to do the trip unless I had somebody to go with me. So I understand the importance of finding somebody to go on that trip. Um, one of the recommendations, I guess my first recommendation is look at the people you know first. Like that's where you got to go first. Like friends, family members, coworkers, even like Facebook strangers or, you know, people in your very, very extended network. Uh, that's where I would look first. There are some places like um, the Adventure Cycling Association, for example, has a Companions Wanted section on their website where you can look for people that are going on bike trips um, and contact them and ask to join their trip. Um, or you can post, excuse me, post an ad yourself um, saying that you're going on a trip and you're looking for someone to join you. My experience with bike touring is it's been quite difficult to find touring partners. One, because most people have jobs and are tied down with their, their work, their family, their kids, bills, etc. So to go on an extended trip for, for most people is quite difficult. That's one of the reasons that most bike tours, like if you go to um, gobicycletouring.com, that's a directory of bike tours all around the world. You'll notice that most of the bike tours on that website are between one and two weeks long. And the reason for that is most people in the world, that's all that they can afford to do is one or two weeks of cycling. And then they have to go back to work. So um, if you're you know, planning a trip, maybe keep that in mind. Like most people can really only do one or two weeks uh, tops um, and once you get over that two week limit, it might be much, much harder to find someone to go with you. So um, yeah, that's what I would do. I guess my other recommendation for looking um, for anybody to go with you, whether it's someone you know or a complete stranger, is test them, um, actually test each other before the trip begins. Like do some shorter bike tours, like an overnight bike tour or something near your home together if you can. Um, like if you're never meeting the person before the trip, it can be quite dangerous. Um, like your personalities could clash. Like the person could just annoy the heck out of you. Um, and I don't really recommend cycling with strangers, um, especially if you're planning a big, long tour. Um, but um, if you're desperate for someone to go with, it's certainly worth a try, I guess. Um, Sophia, I see your question about going alone uh, or with somebody. And the truth of the matter is I enjoy both, but I don't enjoy any one of those things for too long. Like um, I think going by yourself gets really lonely after a long time. And, and, um, and you know, going with another person uh, can 
become annoying after a, after a while also. So um, yeah, it just it just just depends, I guess. Um, if I've like watched a lot of these uh, long distance bike train documentaries, I've probably watched everyone that's out there. And a common theme on these movies is that you know there's conflict between the people on the trips. And um, I think like now that I've done bike tour these bike tours now for 16 years, and I've cycled probably with hundreds of people, I can tell you that I'm like still working on being a good travel partner because I've spent so much time traveling by myself. Like I have these very particular ways that I like to travel, but then when there's another person with me, I got to change my thinking and put myself in their shoes and think about how they're feeling and all that kind of thing. So it's, it is difficult to transition between like worrying about yourself, worrying about another person, worrying about yourself, worrying about another person. Um, it's probably one of the conflicts of, uh, you know, or one of the major difficulties that any bike tourist has to deal with. So, yeah, uh, that's it. I think I'll wrap it up, guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. I'm sorry about the technical complications that we had uh, at the beginning. I thank you for uh, finding me here on YouTube. Um, and, yeah, if you have more information or if you want more information about planning, preparing for, or executing your own bicycle training adventures, go to my website at bicycletouringpro.com. You can also pick up, this is the book you want to get if you're planning your own bike tour. So I'm going to do a little promo here. But this is my book, The Bicycle Touring Blueprint. Um, it's a big book, as you can tell. Um, it's called Bicycle Touring Blueprint, How to Plan, Prepare for, and Execute the Bicycle Tour of Your Dreams. And uh, that's me on the back there. And yeah, it's a 400 page workbook basically that takes you through bike touring from beginning to end. Like there's some worksheets here that will help you uh, plan your trip. Um, I've talked about the book a lot in the past, but check it out if you're planning the trip. It's really like my life's work and everything I've learned about bike touring in 16 years condensed down into paperback form. So check it out. Um, thanks for tuning in guys. and. If you guys go on a bike trip this year, you know, keep me in mind. Send me a picture, a video, or something. Um, a shout out from the road would be great. I'd love to hear from you. So, yeah, thanks, guys. Adios. Have a great day. Bye bye. All right. See you guys. Thanks again. Bye.